getting our Facebook Live group going. I think we I think we're good there. Well, it's seven. I'm sure we'll have a few latecomers coming on, but uh, we'll just go ahead and get started uh, for this evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kevin Sedovic to be here with us this evening for Munch on This, um, a topic that obviously everybody has been talking about in the last couple of months and trying to figure out what to do from here, here on out. So um, this is being recorded. Um, it's also on Facebook Live and it will be posted to the Grazing Land Coalition uh, website and also to the YouTube channel. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Trish Faring, the field rep for the North Dakota Grazing Lands Coalition. And uh, we, uh, most of you look like you've been on here before, uh, are familiar names and faces. Uh, so we had, we had some of these back in uh, January and February and decided there was a few other topics that we wanted to cover. So we're picking up a couple more. Last week I had Ken Miller on talking about May calving. That has been posted to the website and then next week, we'll have Josh and Tara Ducart on Thursday evening, the 15th. And that will be to cover some more holistic management and talk about some of the stressors that are going on right now in everybody's lives. So without further ado, um, if you have questions, uh, I didn't, Kevin, would you prefer questions all at the end or do you have places you want to stop or how do you want to handle that? Um, you know, if, if you see questions, you can just interrupt me. I don't, I'd sooner do that than wait. Okay. Okay. So if you have questions, go ahead and um, you can raise your hand if you know how to do that. Or if you want to, um, you can type it in the chat, <laughs> turn, turn your video on. Um, and then if you're on Facebook live with us, go ahead and type your question in there and then I'll relay that to Kevin as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kevin Sedovic. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks, Trish. I appreciate you coming on today. You know, it's one of those topics that you never want to give because that means that we're dry and that means we're going to have, we may have some issues in terms of forage production. We have to strategize on how we're going to do some management plans. Uh, we've had the, I've had the chance to do some drought talks over the last probably two months, and we did a series of drought uh, webinars or a six-part series that was, was, that, was actually well-received. And, and so I kind of took that and, and updated it for today to, to kind of show you, what I want to do is show you where we're at in terms of the drought look, outlook. I'm going to show you a little bit of data that, that, that kind of I use to kind of create a scenario on what we can expect for forage production if it stays dry or if it gets wet. And so we'll kind of go through that. And I want to end with some management strategies and we can kind of stop in a few times between there to go through that. So I do have a PowerPoint. I bring the PowerPoint up. And what I'll probably do that at some time, I can stop it, go back live, and then bring it back up if we have questions. So um, I hate to PowerPoint you to death, but it's a, it's, it's a great way to really show you what we have. Um, can you see, can you all see it fine, Trish? Uh, nope, it's not sharing right now. Okay, that means I didn't share it. <laughs> um, let me go this. That's funny, because I thought I had myself muted and I didn't, so. <laughs> Grab my, my share button here, wherever that's at. Where's my share? Share screen. I thought it would be easier than I, than I thought. Something's coming up. There we go. All right, how's that? Yep, I can see that. Um, can you put it in slide? Oh, there we go. We're good. It's just a little slow. So, so what I want to do is talk about you know, forecasting forage production based on some different scenarios from the drought. And, and of course, these are scenarios. If, if, you, if you are a, a manager that's been doing everything great the last decade, 20 years or however, you know, those grasslands can tolerate drought better than other ones. So it will vary a bit from operation to operation. But it just kind of gives you a kind of a scenario where we're at. I'm going to grab it. All right, so this just came out, I believe, yesterday. And this is the current North Dakota drought monitoring report. Some of you have seen this before. Um, the redder, the worse we are. So 
we've really been in some kind of a drought since probably July of 2020. Um, and today you can see that 100% of the state is in, a, is in a moderate drought or more. Roughly 93% of the state is in a severe drought or more. And almost 70% of the state is in an extreme drought. So we only have one more level to go and that's exceptional drought. And what's gonna happen on April 15th, when the official uh, farming season starts, they will update this and we will see areas in the extreme drought category. I suspect we're gonna see this area over here is gonna fall in the D4 category, especially around Minot. And even over towards Devil Lake, Devil's Lake might come up, um, but we'll see that coming in, in, in April 15th. And for what that means is once we hit extreme drought, we, we qualify for every program right away. You know, so the, the worse you get, the, the, the quicker you can fall into programs. So it kind of gives you a feel for where we're at. And I want to show you the, the U.S. drought monitor because I think it's important to understand that almost half the, the U.S. is in some kind of a drought. And when you look at Colorado and, and Nevada, eastern Texas, you know, they're in a, also in a D4 and D3 drought. And so if you do know that you probably are gonna look at selling some cattle, um, the, the price for cow calf pears and bred cows are gonna not be, will not be very good because of the, the level of drought that's going on in the country. Cause that market will slide because of the amount of pears that'll be sold in the market. So just be, be kind of proactive on that. If you know you're gonna sell, you know, I would do it earlier than later. Um, I know most ranchers were all optimists and we think it's gonna rain and hope we can get by. Um, we just sold um, 13 head today at, at the livestock ring. Just, I just don't want to have anything out here that I don't need to have out here just to save my grass. So this is actually soil moisture levels. And, and I know I couldn't get just North Dakota, it was fuzzy, but if you look at the map, the bluer the map, the darker the blue, the closer they are to 100% of soil moisture level. The, the darker the red, the worse you are. And you can see there's a big old circle that just wraps around North Dakota that we are in a severe depletion of soil moisture in this state. And so we're actually at less than 5% of normal in most of the state. And some areas are at 2%. What that, what that means is we don't have any reserve. Um, so even if we get some rain, you know, it's gonna take a lot of rain to bring that back up. And so just know that, that you know, we're not only dry, we don't have any soil moisture. And this really, look at the data, this goes all the way down to three feet. So our subsoil moisture is also uh, pretty low. I haven't seen numbers like this since 1988 and 89. That's just how old I am. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a while since we've had numbers like this. And so hopefully it rains, but it, it's just so you understand the complexity of the issues that we're dealing with. So I wanted to look at, when did the drought start? And when we think about the drought, it really started in 2020. We all know it was kind of dry in 2020. But if you remember the fall of 2019, it was one of the wettest falls that we had on record. Um, almost all the state had somewhere between 150 to 280% of normal precip in the fall of 2019. That 280% was actually at Williston. They were the wettest area in terms of normal precipitation in the fall of 19. And that really saved us in 2020. You know, our grasses are deeper than perennials. They got that moisture and they grabbed that moisture. And, and we really should have had a fairly decent year, if not a good year, in terms of forage production. You know, at the research station here, we were at about 56% of normal precip for the summer, but we still produce 12% above normal forage production because of that carryover moisture. And remember now, we don't have that, that's gone. And so this year is just a totally different ball game when it comes to, uh, to water. So when you look at, to me, the drought really got serious in September because we used up a lot of that soil moisture. And so we've been in what I call this, this severe drought from September to April. The beauty of it, most of it so far has been in the winter time. So we all had a great winter. We didn't have any snow. We had the warmest winter on record in North Dakota. And so, you know, we were able to graze cattle all the way till the first week in February on crop residue, cover crops, 
stockpile grass because it just was a great winter to, to feed cattle. You know, at the grassland station, I figured this out, but I was able to graze in the months of from mid-December to the first part of February, I saved almost $40,000 in hay by not feeding during that time period. That's a, that was a huge plus. So I actually had more hay to carry over because of that great winter that we had. So Minot's my example here. Minot, in that seven month period, has had less than one inch of precipitation. That's 12% of normal. They only had 2.6 inches of snow at the airport in Minot. That's probably to me one of the worst areas of the state. So when you look at, at moisture levels from September to April, I grabbed a few different cities in the state to kind of give you a feel for where we're at for, for um, normal precip. But if you just look at Williston, they're at 33% of normal precip during the winter months. Minot's at 12%. Willis, I mean, Devil's Lake's at 13%. Jamestown's at 25%. Streeter and Bismarck are right around that 35 to 40%. The Southwest's a little better. Dickinson's at, at about 50%, and Bowman's at 55%. Bowman had a little more moisture. Um, doesn't quite reach beach there. I'm sorry, Trish, um, but that Bowman area did have a little more moisture uh, this winter. And so if you look at snow totals, I'm going to talk about snow because I think this is going to be important when it comes to water. Um, Williston had eight and a half inches of snow, but you look at Minot and Devil's Lake, you're looking at three inches of snow or less. When was the last winter that you had where you got to experience really no snow. And even when you got two inches, it melted because it was so nice and warm this winter. Jamestown had about 14 inches, Bismarck 14 inches, Dickinson 13 inches, and Bowman about 16 inches. Streeter had actually about 24 and a half inches because we had a nine inch snow event in October that was really nice. But you can see where we're at for snowfall. And you gotta remember, we rely on snowfall to refresh these wetlands and refresh our dugouts. And so if you are relying on a dugout or a dam for your water source, know that you got very little refreshing from the snow melt. Um, one, you're probably, you're probably gonna run out of water if it doesn't rain. But even, even more important is, is, is that water gonna be safe to drink. You know, if, when they get low, they tend to get higher and total dissolved sol solvents, which then you can become toxic. And in some areas, that level becomes actually high in sulfates. And we experienced this last year. We had a, we had a cover crop trial at, at near Tappan. I didn't test the water. I put in a submersible pump, pumped that water out of that water hole into a tank. And two weeks later, I had 10, I had two dead cows. And I'm thinking, why did these cows die? So I finally tested the water. It ran 11,000 TDS. And of that, over 7,000 was sulfates, which is deadly to cattle. And so just know that you may have to test your waters to see where you're at in terms of, of a safe water if you have water at all. The, Kevin, what, it, what is the allow or the safe allowance in there for sulfates? Uh, for sulfates, it's, it's 2,500 and TDS it's 5,000. Okay. So we were double what it should have been. Thank you. And so Trish put this up today on Facebook, but the governor did declare a statewide drought disaster today. And so Governor Bergam and, and Ed Commissioner Goring announced the Livestock Water Supply Program will be reactivated. This was last activated in 2017 during the drought of 17. Uh, if you, when you look at this number, they actually had about a little over half a million dollar carryover from that 2017 declaration. And so there's dollars available for producers to look at water development. And so if you know you think there's gonna be a potential for water develop, develop needs, do it now. Uh, call the Ag Commissioner, call the, the, the U.S. Department of Ag and try and get in this program early. For one, it, the money could run out. But second is trying to find the labor to put in a well or to put in a trench in a line. And so you're actually allowed up to $4,500 per project. And you're allowed to do three projects on your operation. And so last time they spent $1.7 million, they carried over over half a million. So you're probably looking at about two and a half million dollars that will be available for livestock producers. So take advantage of it um, since it's there and take advantage of it early. Any questions on that? All right, the other thing that was declared was the emergency haying and grazing of CRP. 
This actually was already declared in October of 2020. So it's been out for quite a while. This is today's map, came out this morning uh, by the US Department of Ag. And you can see all of North Dakota is eligible at this time for emergency haying and grazing. Obviously we don't have any haying to do or grazing to do, but even those three counties in the Southeast are also eligible because they butt up against a county that's been declared. So the whole state is eligible. So this is gonna happen if you have CRP, if you know producers who have CRP that you can tie into and you need to put up some hay or you need to graze it, take advantage of this program. We won't see the guidelines for a while yet. You know, when are they gonna allow us to do early grazing? When are they gonna allow us to do the haying? Traditionally, the current guideline is you can't hay till after August 1, and that's based on, on nesting season for waterfall. That typically gets moved up with a severe drop by July 15. Um, so uh, I, I would predict that we're gonna see a, that July 15 day used, um, which should give you a little better quality. But I could see us then releasing this for haying by June 1, if it stays this dry. So if you, even if you don't have CRP, if you know people who have CRP, you can take advantage of it. It's a pretty good program to get you by during these drought years for, for a little low cost. All right, so when, it, when you look at predicting forage production, it, it's important to understand that we grow most of our grass in the month of May and June. And those of you who've done this for a living, like all you do, you probably know that. And so May, June precipitation is the critical time period for us to grow our grass in forages in North Dakota. The next critical month is actually September because we actually grow our spring grass in the fall. The fall tillers are our first tillers in the spring. And so that September moisture is critical. When it gets dry in the fall like we saw last year, those tillers actually will die. And so then you're starting from a new tiller in the spring. And we'll cover that in a little bit later here. But what I wanna show you here, this graph just shows you three different grasses and their growth curves, average growth curves for North Dakota. The red graph is Western wheatgrass and you can see it produces about 90% of its growth by July 1 and 100% of its growth by the third week in July. The green graph is blue grama grass. It produces about half of its growth by July 1, but almost 100% by the end of July. So that June moisture still drives blue grama growth. For those of you who live in the Coteau, like we are at Streeters, that's anywhere from Bismarck to Jameson, all the way up to Minot, all the way up to Williston to Divide County. Uh, bluegrass is common. It's by one of the more common grasses we have in our pastures. And the growth pattern of, blue, of Tucky bluegrass, three quarters of its growth occurs by June 1. If it doesn't rain in May, you're not gonna grow a lot of bluegrass. Even if you may not like bluegrass, it's still a viable feed source for cattle. And so we need May moisture for that grass to grow. And it's, it's virtually done reaching peak production by July 1. So you can see we need rain at this time period if we're gonna grow grass. And we know by that first or second week in June, you know if you're gonna have a good year or if you're gonna have a bad year. Don't wait till August, don't wait till September. Cause I can tell you in June, you're gonna have less grass. That second period really is that September period when, you, when we rely on that fall growth. So I look at that time period to tell me if I'm gonna at least go into the next year on a normal grazing schedule. If that is gone, you typically will see a delay in growth in the spring. And I'll show you that I have one slide, I took a bunch of slides out, but I have one slide to kind of talk about that. So just remember that in the back of your head when you look at strategizing, what, what we need for moisture and when we need it. What I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you, don't get scared. Um, but I took a 20 year data set that I have forage production on and I overlaid that with moisture in May and June and the fall to kind of predict if we have this in 2021, here's what you can expect for production. And I'm only doing this so you can kind of get a feel for, okay, if this happens, I know I'm only gonna have this much grass, what should I do to, to, to strategize about it? And then we'll talk about management uh, to kind of get you through that. So this is the data set. It's 20 years, 
These red bars is forage production for each year. And that red dotted line is the average forage production across the 20 years. So everything above it is above normal, below it is, is below normal. The blue line is precipitation in the months of May and June only. That's what drives forage production. The black dotted line is 100% of normal precip in May and June. So you can see all these, these wet Mays and Junes and you see all these dry Mays and Junes. And what I'm gonna focus on is three time periods. At the very top, these dotted lines means that we had 40% or more below production moisture in the fall. So we had what I call a severe drought in the fall. We had six of them in that 20 year period. I'm gonna focus on three of them because really three of them happened in back to back to back years. This year was an anomaly. Even though it was a very dry fall, we had 150% of normal moisture. So we carried over moisture. So that year, you really didn't do a whole lot because of, of the moisture we had. <clears throat> so I'm gonna look at these three years independently to kind of give you a feel of what happened, what happened the following year. So in 1991, we had a, a dry fall. We had about 70% of normal precip in the month of May and June, and we produced average forage production. Even though we were dry, um, we still had, what happened was, I don't show you 1990, 1990 was wet. So it carried over and so we produced normal production. If you look, so you look at 1992, we actually had a normal precip year in 92 and we still had 22% loss of forage production, even with normal precipitation. So that tells me in 2021, if we have normal precip in the, in the summertime or spring, we are still gonna see a loss of forage production because of what happened last fall. For today, any Germans out there? No, I got one to laugh. All right, so this is 2002. And some of you are old enough to, to remember 2002. So in 2001, we had a normal precip year. We, we produced again, normal for production. We had a dry fall in 22. We produced about 50% of normal precip um, and it was hot. 2002 was not only a dry year, it was a hot year. So we produced 56% loss of forage production in 2002. We also had a very severe drought in the fall of 2002. What happened in three of those, we produced 150% of normal precip in May and June. So it actually brought us up to normal forage production. That was it, we got normal for a wet spring because we were so dry the previous fall, okay? We'll look at one more. So let's look at 2006. I remember 2006 really well, because I remember uh, in July, I was collecting data down by Zealand. Anybody here from the South Central? Uh, Zealand is what we call behind the Iron Curtain. It's where the Germans originally came from and stayed. Another story. But it was really hot. And I remember I was working over that time period and the highs were 103 to 109 every day. So I was not only sweating, I was miserable. But if you look at 05, so look at 05, we actually were above normal precipitation in May and June. We had a severe drought in the fall. We had a severe drought the next year at about 50% or less. And we lost 40% of our production. The reason it was not as bad as 2002 is because we were above normal precip in 2005. But we still lost 40% because of that. 2006, we had a normal fall moisture. 2007, look at 2007. We produced 183% of normal precip in May and June. And that did give us above normal forage production that year because we had so much moisture in that time period. So you can see how May and June moisture will really drive what's going to happen this coming spring and how that fall boy, how that falls going to drive it. I do want to show you what happened the last three years. So this is 2020 on your right. We were at about, I can't see the bar because I got pictures there, but I think it was about 55% normal precip, 60% in that month. We had a very wet fall in, in 19, had a very wet fall in, in 18. Uh, we had below normal pre for production both those years, and we still produced above normal precipitation in 2020 because of that wet fall. That's not a scenario that we have today, but at least you can think about in the, fu in the future, if we have these, these wet falls, they do really set you up well to be successful the following year. 
Is there any questions? If you do have a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. So this is unusual. So I get to sit here and give a talk and chew snooze at the same time and drink my Diet Coke at the same time. I don't get to do that at most talks. <laughs> but if you have any questions, we'll go, I'm going to kind of go on to the next series here. Okay. All right. So let's talk about drought. So not every drought is the same. So I'm going to go through some scenarios, but it's important to understand how, how when you get the drought, how it impacts you. I just got one slider. So if we do see a spring drought, this does have your greatest negative effect on forage production. Most of you all know that. If we have a normal spring, but have a summer drought, we typically don't see much difference in terms of forage production, but you see a dramatic decline in forage quality. These are the years where you see livestock performance the worst. Um, when you see a spring drought, you produce less grass, but usually livestock performance is better because you have a dry, cured, immature plant most of that season. The summer droughts, so with a, with a wet spring, tend to, you see performance issues because of low forage quality. And then if you get these fall droughts, like we saw last year, last year we really had a, the fall drought, it has the greatest negative effect on, on plant vigor and then next year's growth, how it starts, if that makes sense. So let's look at three scenarios. So if we come into this spring and we're getting really close to the time period I'm talking about, below normal spring moisture, I'm talking May and June here, you can expect a severe reduction in forage production of, of 35 to 55%. You know, so you have to, to ask yourself, can you handle a 50% loss of forage production with your current resources on your current livestock herd? Um, and if you can, if you can say yes, you know, you, that's probably the worst case scenario. That will be the worst case scenario. If you can get by through that, um, then you're probably fine. If you can't, then you need to be thinking about how you're going to get, how you're going to manage that. Do you need to plant an annual forage to give you some more production? Of course, it takes rain to grow an annual forage. But if the opportunity is there, think about a foxtail millet or a forage oats or a cover crop that you can put in at the last minute you know, that, that, that could get you by some forages. Um, you need to start looking at calling your herds, picking out your older herd, those open cows. Um, I'm not talking about today, but there's strategies you can look at that you can deal with. If we have a normal spring moisture, so that's give or take 100% of moisture in May and June, I think we're still gonna see a reduction of about 20% because of what happened last year. Most producers, if you have a good grazing system in place, you can handle it. That's not a big deal. If you do not, you may not be able to handle that. And if you came into last fall and you were overgrazed, you will see even more loss of production because you don't have that ground covered. Your roots are then are somewhat suppressed and you can see more losses in terms of production on those pastures that were overgrazed in the fall. You know, the best case scenario is, is a wet spring. Of course, we wanna time that wet spring so you can get your crops in. Um, but obviously, if we get a wet spring, and I'm talking, you know, that 120, 130 percent normal precip, we'll probably be close to normal forage production. If we get above 150, you will probably get above normal production. If you have a good grazing management strategy in place, you will have more than normal forage production because your grasses are healthy, your soils are healthy, and your roots are, are, are also in great shape. So management plays a major role in how you're impacted good or bad, so there's something to think about. Most of you I know are good managers on, on, on here. I only got one slide in here. I had about three in here to start with, but I don't wanna to get too long, but I, I do think it's important to understand that because of the fall drought, we lost our tillers that will come up this spring. And so that loss of tiller usually means a two week delay in turnout in the spring. The caveat is, we have been so warm, we, have, we are so far above growing degree days that I probably could be wrong. We could actually be normal because of the number of growing degree days we already have in place.
but I think it's important to at least plan for, for less grass, even if we get the growing degree days and we don't have the water, you still have to make sure you have enough biomass out there to handle your herd. Remember when you graze grass, you want to graze the cows the, the, right behind how the grass grows. So as the grass grows, you want to graze right behind that. If you go out with too many cows too early, the cows are ahead of the grass growth curve and you lose biomass because they're consuming it. Then the grass can't recover fast enough. And so you want to make sure you have enough biomass to cover your herd or at least be able to rotate through to get by. This is something you think about this spring because you're going to start from a brand new tiller and not last fall's tiller. All right. So what are some strategies you can look at? And I know in the Western Dakotas, many of you have some crested wheatgrass. Crested wheatgrass is a great grass to go out in the spring. The beauty of crested, it is probably the most resilient grass we have. You can graze the living snot out of crested wheatgrass. And as long as you let it recover, it'll be fine. It's just an amazing grass. We, some people cuss it, but it does have its positives. The other one is smooth brome. So if you're in the Coteau or Northern North Dakota and you have some brome fields, another great option for May grazing. It is not as resilient. It can't take the grazing pressure like crested wheat does. So you don't want to graze it quite as hard as the crested. But you know, if you give it enough recovery, it'll, it'll, be, it'll do just fine. But that's probably your best option if you have those scenarios. If you are in the Coteau and you have some pastures that are really heavy Kentucky bluegrass, at the research station, we have a few of these pastures that are probably 70% bluegrass. And they're a pasture I would look at to turn out early. Bluegrass is not as early as crested or brome. It's about two weeks after crested. But you can graze bluegrass really hard. And the beauty of it is you can hurt it. You can actually stress bluegrass. And it's not going to kill it, but your native grasses can take that. And they'll come back through that system. So you can pick and choose some of your cells where you have a lot of bluegrass that you can go in early. And I think what's, what's important is that I think with the dry year, I think we need to actually manage our crested wheatgrass or our brome and actually do some kind of strip grazing or rotational grazing on your crest. I know a lot of producers who have a 40 acre crested field or 80 acre crested field, turn the cows out in May, they graze it till they're done and they go on pasture, native pasture. If you just split it once, just a two pasture system. So you can create some natural deferment and some recovery. You can increase your use by almost 30% in that one month. So you can get third in one month, that's 10 more days. In a drought, that's a big difference. So just what I like to do is actually graze my first cell for seven days or a week, go on the next one for two weeks, then come back to the cell and graze it till it's gone. Then go on the, the, the second one again and graze that one until it's gone. If you do that right, you could actually get yourself into June to save yourself on your native range to get that water. I don't like to save native range too long because then you lose the opportunity to capture regrowth and, and, and grazing efficiency on native range. But I would split those at least once, just a hot wire and rotate through it. Or you can strip graze it. And I mean by strip grazing it, just from your water source, you take a poly wire and you move it every five, seven days, and keep moving it from your water source till you strip it off. That will still improve your efficiency, just a way to increase more grazing days on these pastures. And that's true of all your pastures, but with, with crescent, you can really get some out of it. So I wanna end with some grazing management. And so and I know this group is really good at, at doing grazing strategies. Um, so if you don't have it in place, and I tell producers, you know, you can really get by a drought if you have a good grazing system in place. You have healthy grasses, you have healthy soils. They use the water you get, and so you can capture the growth. And so it's important to, to look at having healthy grasslands. Um, a nice thing about a system will do is it does give you natural deferment, and it gives you natural recovery uh, when you come off of it. And, and you can do as little as you want or as many as you want. Uh, some is better than none. And, and with producers, I tell producers, you know, build into your system that fits your time, your labor, and your water. Water always comes first, but then labor will drive how much you wanna get in terms of intensity. Minimize your overuse to 25% of your rotation system. 
These grasses are extremely resilient. They can take a one-time hit. And as long as you give them some deferment the next spring, they'll be just fine. You know, I think we've gotten pretty soft as ranchers today. You know, the old days we would, we would beat the crap out of our pastures. Today, we're just the opposite. We think when we hear grasses have nerves that they actually feel pain. Well, they don't. You can actually graze your grasses one time fairly hard and it will recover just fine. So don't be afraid to graze your grass. In a drought year, those grasses shut down. Don't be afraid to graze your grass. Just know when you manage it, you create some natural deferment and recovery back in the system. So I'm gonna show you a system. One thing I need to point out, if you do overgraze a cell, and we see this on the, on the pastures that we do overgraze, we do it purposely, you will see a loss of livestock performance. They run out of feed, it's just the way it is. Don't expect to get the best performance in those scenarios. So I'm gonna show you a system that, that, that we started three years ago. And when you think about grazing systems, the traditional rancher would graze a system in a homogenous way. They would graze each cell to get some kind of use, go to the next one, go to the next one, and you create homogenous across your system, which nothing wrong with that, but it's not as efficient in terms of creating resiliency in your operation for droughts. So what we did is we actually created a four cell system where I graze one of my cells hard. And I'm talking 65 to 70% degree of use, but it gets rested the next year. I have a full use that's take half, leave half. I have a moderate that's, that's what I say takes 20 to 40%. And I create a rested cell. I don't think I need a rested cell, but I'm doing it primarily to try and enhance pollinators and wildlife habitat. So, so with this system, my average degree of use over the three years has been give or take 30%. And I'm stocked at 25% heavier than normal. And I'm creating heterogeneity across my system. Now in a drought year like this year, I will graze that rested cell. I will become adaptive and I'm gonna go in there and make it a four, an actual four cell rotation. So I get 25% more banked feed because of the resiliency I built into the system. In the end, what this, what, what, what this trial has done for me is it actually gives me more pollinator habitat and it gives me more habitat for birds and it gives me a reserve. Every year I have a reserve. And if you live in Western North Dakota, you should have some of that built into your system because you always experience drought every other year or something, you know, but it's, it's a great way to do that. And it does create this heavy use. When I get done, it looks like a golf course, but the next year, my big blue stem and my switchgrass are all expressed because the warm season get a chance to express themselves. So it's just one way to look at it. The third one, I know most of our Western ranchers do have what I call a traditional winter pasture or what I call a stockpile pasture. You can use that pasture in the month of June. Um, in June, while that's actively growing, you can actually graze that cell and as long as there's some moisture, it will regrow and you will actually have the same amount of grass the next winter. We did this at Hedinger, actually we were in South Dakota. We did this over a five year period where we grazed our stockpile pastures for two to three weeks in the month of June. In three out of the five years, we produced more grass in the winter than if we did not. The other two years were a no net gain, a no net loss. So I tell producers they should graze their winter pastures every year or rotate through them at least for two weeks. The struggle they have is, well, my winter pasture is way over there. So it becomes logistics more than anything else. But if you can do it, when that grass is actively growing, capture that to get the regrowth. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to use that during drought years to get some benefit out of it. All right, I'm gonna end here with looking at some recommendations. Then we can have some discussion afterwards. So I do want you to think about this turnout pasture, turnout when it's ready. This year, it, it, it should be delayed, but I think it, with the winter grazing, it may not be. But look about, think about crested, growing for early spring grazing. If you do have winter cereals, and you can think about this for 2022 or 2021. Winter cereals are a great opportunity to give you some spring grazing in that month of May. We did it this year at Central Grassland Station. We seeded uh, in 2019 with winter rye, winter triticale, and winter wheat, actually, the Willow Creek. And we grazed heifers on that in the whole month of May this year. 
Our heifers gained about a pound a day on the winter rye. The, the, the Willow Creek they did not because we, they were, it grows too slow. Um, but it's a great resource you can use. And if you don't need it for grazing, you can always put it up for hay. The trick with winter rye for hay is you gotta put it up at the right time where it, it becomes really ground, you gotta grind it. Um, yeah, I put this up here because it's true, but most producers hate to do this. You may have to feed longer, but most producers and most cows don't want to be in there as long as they, you know, they want to get out as soon as they can. So if you do turn out early, use the pastures that were grazed the least last fall. So take that pasture that has enough recovery in there. That's the one you should start in. It's, it'll be your greatest opportunity to not, not, not lose production for that given year. That's really the only trick to it is, is try to come in on those cells. Um, what you want to try and do then is minimize repeated years of overgrazing on those salt, on those cells, especially in the fall. That's when you start to see the weeds come in and you start to see production going down. There's those back-to-back -back years, especially in the Western Dakotas. You know, the Coteau, you, you can handle it a little better because we get a little more water. All right, so limit that overgrazing. So if you are going to overgraze the cell, if we stay dry, I know you don't have a lot of choices, Minimize your overgrazing to 20% of your land or less and pick one or two pastures because it's easy then to take those two the next year and defer them. Give them some recovery so they can, can get, and we rarely see back to back to back years of drought. So if we do suffer two years, more than likely that third year we're gonna get moisture and you'll give them a chance to recover. So just minimize that to that 20% or less. And, and like I said, they are very resilient pastures that can take that to some level. I mean, you think about it. When the bison came into these areas, they didn't overgraze them. They pummeled them. And then they left. They may not have come back for two or three years, um, but they got recovery. And so our native grasses can take it. They can take a little bit of abuse. Um, last, if you haven't developed a drought management strategy plan, develop one. Always have one set up that, that now it talks about how you're going to manage your, your resource, but also manage your herd because there are two different things, but both of them will be critical when it comes to getting you by uh, in terms of the drought scenarios. Remember, if it doesn't rain in May or June, you're going to have a bad year, just the way it is. We don't, I, I like to use 2000, I showed you 2006. 2006 was actually an above normal precip year when you look at the whole growing season for streeter. What happened was we got eight and a half inches of rain in the early part of August. We didn't grow any more grass, but we had normal precip for the year. It all came from that May, June period. So the beauty of the August and July rains, the greens up, you get some growth, but you don't grow a whole lot more grass. That, that added precip will give you no more than 20% of your growth. It does improve quality. So I think I'm gonna end there and I'm gonna stop sharing so we can have some discussion. Thanks, Kevin. Um, you can, uh, I guess one comment that I had on the Facebook was if you had touched on uh, twice over systems and what your thoughts were on that. Great questions and I didn't, so my, that rotation system that I showed you is actually a twice over system. Okay. I call, I call it a modified twice over rest rotation grazing system. Okay. And so I, I graze everything twice. The, the way it's designed, it actually gets 35 days of recovery on the heavy cell and it goes to 45 days and 65 days. Um, for me, I increased my efficiency with the twice over by as much as 65%. And we, we've tested this. I, I can show, well, I can sit over the papers, but when we do the rotations, we actually increase grazable forage from 30 to 65%, depending on the moisture year and depending on the grazing intensity, heavy versus full versus moderate. The minimum we do is 30%. That's 30% more grazable grass. So for me, to not come back and capture it is a loss of, of efficiency in, in reality. So that, that's where I'm coming from on that. So that's why I do like that system. I know when you get to beach, you get to the Western Dakotas, you have less grass, you have less moisture, that efficiency probably goes down. 
because you don't get as much regrowth. But what I end up doing, and I, and I, show, I have some report, is I, I'm actually able to then identify how much grass I capture that goes into the cow, and then how much is left, and then how much is actually regrow that regrew during that recovery period. It's the first study I've ever seen that actually was able to do that. But to do that, I have to have someone clipping every time we move, when we go in, and when we come out. So it takes a lot of a lot of man, a lot of people hours to do it, but it's pretty cool. Great. Um, another question that came in is: I wanted to graze my pasture that has wormwood in early. Should I still do it this year? It is a retired CRP field. I would say absolutely. If, if it's a if it's a pasture versus range, um, it's a great place to start because it'll be earlier. Um, if you get a little pressure on it early, you actually get some use of the wormwood. We can get cows to graze wormwood, especially early. Not that they like it, but they will do it when you get your stock density high enough. So I would say, yeah, that's a great place to start. And if you get a little use of your wormwood, that's even better. And the wormwood will not kill them. It's not poisonous. Okay. It doesn't taste very good. But. <laughs> it doesn't smell very good most of the time either. <laughs> um. Another thing I was just thinking about in um, talking about moisture in the time of the year, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, if we do get the earlier rain and kind of going down the path of moving those cattle faster during the wetter part of the year versus slowing them down during, once we get into those drier months, which, I mean, we don't know what'll happen at this point, but. I mean, that's the practice that we do as well. So we rotate faster on the, during the fast growth period of the grass. Because what you're trying to do, in theory, is to graze every grass before it heads out, which is impossible to do. But in theory, if you can do that, you will prolong maturation, you will prolong the growth phenology, and you will capture more regrowth as long as there's moisture to do that. So we do about 35% of our days in the first rotation, and 65% of our days in the second rotation. Okay. And, and there are people, you know, that's a twice over. If you do it three times over, you could even become a little, even more efficient, especially in the Coteau where we got moisture. And then I'd probably do like a 25, 35, 45. You know, the trick is to try and get all of your pastures grazed by July 15th. It's always easier said than done. It's like when I, when I used to, when I started this job 30 years ago, I told producers, try and put up all your hay before July 1, because you'll get the best quality feed. I run a research station that puts up a thousand acres of hay. I cannot do it all by July 1. So you, then you pick and choose how you do that to capture the best out of it. So I learned fast, uh, actually I learned slow. <laughs> it's not possible to do that if you have a lot of acres. And grazing the same way. Yeah. You brought up another, um, and I wrote this down, and Jay Fear has, has always said this as far as even on the cropland side of things, when you're, like you were talking about those tame grass pastures, maybe it's a brome grass pasture, and it's one pasture. You know, even if you can go out there and split it into two, and, you know, he always says one field at a time. Well, it's really no different with a grazing system. One pasture at a time, one fence at a time. Um, anything that you do is, is better than nothing. Absolutely. You know, I, I think the nice thing about Crest is you're going to capture it in that one month, six weeks, whatever it is. You can get by with really one polyworm. You know, if you did two and got three, you'd probably be a little better. But I don't, because of that time period, one's probably all you really need. Um, with, with native range, it's a bit different. You know, I always, you know, I, I like a minimum of three just to get started. You know, I, I struggle with what is the threshold. Because when you add fence, you have to have water. It all costs money. And so there's obviously a, an operation, whether it's 42 cells. How do they pay for 42 cells? I have no clue. Even with polywork, it, it's the labor is there, but whatever works for you, but always start, obviously start small and build to where you're comfortable with. Anything is better than nothing. Right. And, and when it comes to range management, there's an art and science to range management. The art is that period of learning how to, how to rotate cows to watch the grass. It just takes, it takes time and, and knowledge. It takes maturity. You all think we're smart when we're 25, but you're really not. 
you know, you get smarter as you see things and experience. Yeah. And the other thing too, that I always think is important is you as a, an individual, a couple, a family, however, whatever your operation is set up as you have to put the system together so that it's workable for you so that it's not an extra stress on you, but yet, you know, it, there has to be balance there. And, you know, maybe that's a every three day move. Maybe it's a every five day move, or maybe you don't mind moving them twice a day. You know, if, if that's what you enjoy, then so be it. But there's definitely that balance. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, quality of life is, is, is even more important. So whatever gives you the best quality of life, that's what you do. Right. You know, so even for ours, I think we actually rotate out about various from 11 days to about 25 days, depending on, on where I'm at. Yeah. Um, any questions? Anybody that would like to unmute themselves, you're more than welcome to anytime. Hi, this is Lewis. I got I got a question about. I have a lot of smooth brome uh, this spring because last year we had a we had quite a bit of rain in June, and those pastures that had gone, you know, already through the rotation, you know, the the uh, brome went ahead and got mature, you know, and it's it's tall. So, what's your recommendation about grazing that? Would you go in it? early time or would you wait on that too or what's the best way to utilize that that old forage that's out there the old forage well that's you know i've got a tremendous amount i mean it's a lot you know it's it's it, it, you wouldn't know it had been grazed actually yeah. <laughs> well the, the caveat you're going to have with that much old forage is you got a low quality feed yeah which is it just it is what it is and, and if you if you don't get a lot of green growth, if it stays dry and you're going to rely on that old growth that's a lot of your feed, your limiting factor is protein. There's no protein in the grass. You can actually improve the grazing efficiency of that cow by providing a protein supplement. I know I don't want to provide a supplement, but you have to get those microbes. You think it's insane. We did that this year. So this year we grazed corn stalks from mid-November to February. And we went from corn stalks to brome grass, but all we provided them was a protein supplement in the form of, of, a, of a liquid. It cost us eight cents a day to do it. Our cows gained weight on low quality feed because the rumen was able to, to, to take that low quality feed and convert it into a viable product. If you don't provide protein, You'll see it because their bellies will be big because of all the fiber, because they can't break it down, and you'll see a, a loss of production performance. And they won't eat it very efficiently. So if that was your scenario, whatever you can find is a cheap source of protein, you'll enhance the, not only the utilization, but performance by doing that. Whatever I, I have a lot of, you know, these these pastures are hooked to, to other native rangeland that don't have bro on it. So on a on a rotation how long how long in between does it take to get that uh, moved out of their system that you know when they have too much brome and then you go on to native you know native rangeland that wouldn't have any brome and i'm just curious is it is it a few days because i can run it back and forth it, it's connected i'm just curious what what do you think it would be it's 48 to 72 hours okay that's all it takes for passage of the room in the complete cycle Okay, thanks. You bet. Kevin, yeah, do you want to expand on a little bit of that some more? Would you, would it be better in that situation to take that brome and just, whatever size the pastures, let's just say that it's, you know, 100 acres or something. Are you better off letting them have all of that at one time? Or would you go in there and strip graze that to force them to eat that? I mean, I guess as long as you had that protein yeah. supplement. You're, you're correct. I mean, that'd be one way to... Increase stock density so they, they don't become quite as selective. So you can strip graze that brome, but it sounds like you have a lot of brome. <laughs> um, but if you, if you, if you, the more you can get the stock density up, the less selective they are. And you'll get a little bit of a trampling effect on that old tissue as well to get down to the ground. Um, that's a way to, to, to be more efficient. If you don't have, it sounds like you have hundreds of acres, you know. So if, if you could do that, that would be a great way to do that, what you're talking about. 
And if you can, if you can graze it that way, you will also see less old tissue carry over. And so you're, it, it may be something to think about it is take half your land and graze half of it right. And the other half, you may have to and then flip it the next year. So you can get this kind of a, a better effect. Because if you graze the brome in the spring, it'll get thicker in terms of tillers. And you're, you sound to me that you've got a little bit of openness in there. You got these stocky brome, you got green tissue coming up. But if you can thicken that up, you what, you, what happens is the grass actually aborts seed production when it has to compete among each other. And so that's why you see lots of seed heads on some of these open brome fields. Because brome fields become lack of fertility. It's just the way they are. Crested's the same way. And so you probably have never fertilized them unless you put some manure in there. But if, if they lack fertility, they lack the way they, they, they lack their, the way they grow. And so you get this impact that you're, that you're talking about. And so it might be just a way to strategize over a three year period to try and maximize a third of it every year so you can rotate that maximum period. You may actually want to put some up for hay. Yeah. So would you encourage if, if you're going to overgraze anything, which you overgraze, you would overgraze where the where you have the most brome? Yes. But but give it recovery because brome does brome what happens with brome is if you overgraze it too too many years in a row, it converts to bluegrass. It doesn't take the heavy use like crested does or bluegrass does, and so they'll shift to a bluegrass, which is less productive than your brome is. I think that's interesting that, Lewis, you have the option there, though, to with that close proximity to to be in some of that brome and then switch to some native and go back to it. So it's kind of an interesting combination to have available. Yeah, the, you know, the, the East River pastures, we have that we have that ability, but not not the West River. So, yeah, we're, we're in the, a different situation there, too. So, yeah. Um, another question that came in, Kevin, this might be the almighty question. What do you think of drought cycle short and long-term patterns? Isn't that a climatology, a climatology question? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> do we need Adnan on here? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I do know if you look at the, the weather data, is our growing seasons have grown are eight days longer than they were 30 years ago. And almost all of it is in the backside in the fall. So we've experienced this. And when that happens, it creates a, a favorable environment for exotic closing grass. That's why we see so much bluegrass the last 20 years, so much brown grass the last 20 years, is because of this. If you want to call it climate change, you call it whatever you want, but it's a climate shift to a warmer, longer growing season in northern plains, which is great for us. You get a, a little warmer winter. Um, but it does affect the plant community. Um, and I do think in terms of droughts, they are very patterned. You know, you think about it, and I've been doing this a long time, I can almost tell when we're gonna get into a drought scenario. We saw this coming. Um, actually, it, it, I thought it was gonna come in 19, but it didn't really come till 20. Um, so the, you can watch those patterns, but that, that's a guessing game. I, I'm not a weather, weather person, <laughs> but I didn't answer your question. I kind of jabbered more <laughs> <laughs> well that's not an easy question to answer for anybody but no but I, if you've seen Adnan's talk he did kind of get into some patterns when we give that first round webinar he kind of talked about patterns yeah um Larry I'll try to uh post a link to a webinar that Kevin did with a climatologist and he had some really good information on there and I'll try to share that. I might have shared that on the um, Facebook page, but if, if you're not on Facebook, just message me and I will, or get a hold of me and I can get you that information. So um, that series was actually really good too. So uh, any other questions? Anybody else want to unmute themselves? I think I recognize almost everybody on here. I gotta say hi to Gwen. When? Yep, she's popped on quite a few of ours so far. Bob's got to be there somewhere. Yep, he is. <laughs> but other questions, I do appreciate you come, come, uh, allowing me to come in today. I don't get to talk, talk in front of this group very often, but it's probably my favorite group to talk to because it, it is the people who are working on the ground. 
and they actually tend to be the most proactive of our ranchers. So, I mean, I get to cover them all, but this group is always fun to be interactive with. And I, got, always... I got a question. Uh, wondering, can you, can we in North Dakota graze winter wheat um, that I want to put up for hay and still hay it if we start getting moisture? Y yes. So we, we planted the Willow Creek winter wheat, I think six of the last seven years. And it never fails us. It, it doesn't winter kill like some of our normal grain winter wheats do. Um, the caveat with the winter wheats versus winter rye and winter tree kale is it grows slower. You know, if you remember winter rye, we always say you need to throw up the pasture <clears throat> on, rye, on, <clears throat> on rye early because it gets away on you. That's not true of, of, the, of the Willow Creek winter wheat. It grows more like this. The winter rye grows like this. And so you still, if you look to harvest the winter rye, I would not use winter rye for grazing. I mean, I, I would not use the winter wheat for grazing in May because rye and triticale are better. Economically, they're by far superior. But for a hay crop in June, especially mid-June, thermic in June, it is probably the best hay that we ever put up. It's just that good of quality feed. It stays low in lignin content so I can feed it without grinding it as well. And then what we do is we typically follow it with a millet. We'll take it up to put up for hay. We'll come in with a foxtail millet and double crop it for a hay crop if the moisture is there. Did that answer your question, Andrew? Well, I was just wondering, can I, like now my cows are still on it while they're just starting to come up. Okay. Can I raise it a little bit this spring before I pull the cows off? Does that hurt it? Yeah, but I mean, the winter wheat is going to be touchier than say winter rye. But as long as you don't, as long as you don't graze it down to the ground, it, it will come back. But it's a little bit more finicky than a rye, just, just so you know. You can't graze it as hard. Is it is it going to hurt it if I'm just grazing it right now? And I thought as soon as it starts raining, I'll pull the cows. Yeah, I think you're you're fine now. But but I, I would be, I'd be you know in the next probably two weeks. You probably want to want to pull them off. So you, if if that's you, you want to take a good hay crop off. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? We've had some good questions. Mr. Nays, do you have any questions? <laughs> No, I'll, if I'm supposed to talk, I'll just start complaining about how much that map shows Bowman precipitation that Bowman's getting that I watch go by. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I was thinking about you when you had that up there. I was like, oh, I'll bet if, I know a few people down there that might disagree with that. <laughs> yeah, and you know, that's Bowman weather station there. <clears throat> if you look at the pattern, it's been basically Bowman North, like the Amadon not Bowman South, what I've noticed. Where, of course, we're Chad, you're South of so. But you got- I can testify right to that. Yeah. <laughs> Another question that came in off Facebook, Kevin, is, is there a certain leaf stage I should wait for to graze winter triticale? Winter triticale, so <clears throat> winter triticale grows very similar to winter rye. And so what, what we did last year is, we, went, we didn't go on a leaf stage. We went, we went for a height of about eight inches. Um, so I don't know what leaf stage was, but we were gonna go out earlier, um, but we had a really hard freeze on May 6th. And so it went from being six inches tall to four. So I waited an extra four days to get me eight inches. I probably should have went on at six inches because I, I actually, the winter triticale got ahead of me about, about May, 28, 29, I, I kind of got, it got ahead of my cows. Um, so I would say if you get about six inches, I, I would let her go, especially if moisture, you got some moisture in there. Because once it goes, it's going to go. And usually it goes about that May 10, May 15, all of a sudden it just goes. And, and, and rise even faster. Rise up even a little faster than triticale. 
Okay, another question that just came in. Can you describe a grazing rotation system on alfalfa fields if the drought is really severe? Well, the alfalfa should be safe because <laughs> it won't have any dew on it. Um, I really, I, I probably can't answer very well. I've never done that. Uh, I don't deal with, I, I know, it, I know it, there's people who have done it. I mean, even the Maddox have done it and I, I think Bob's even done it. Um, alfalfa can be managed. I, I can't answer very well, I'm sorry. I'd be guessing. We have uh, one of our systems that has a significant amount of alfalfa in it, and it's it's alfalfa that's been in there for, I don't know, I'm sure probably 30 years because it was in CRP at one point in time. Um, we have not really had any issues with it, but um, the guy that had the pasture before us, he did have some issues with the bloat, and I don't know, I guess the only thing I would really say is if you've got bloat blocks and, and you feel that they're necessary, but would you like with those alfalfa ke fields, Kevin, would you, would you s try to rotate those with something else so that you're kind of in a high protein, maybe you go to some native grass that's not very good would, and come back or would you stay on it steadily or? The rule of thumb is if you're gonna, is to stay on it steadily. If when you go from a high quality to a lower quality, okay. you go back, the rumen has to then readjust. And you're trying to get that rumen to, to, to tolerate the bloat. And it's bloat's just a function of too much dew on the plant. If you graze an alfalfa that's dry, you will not have bloat. Um, but we always have dewy mornings sometimes. So you want to acclimate those cows on there so you reduce your risk. If you can use bloat guard, we typically will start bloat guard 30 days before because they don't like bloat guard. It's not the, not the best tasting. Uh, source. So you want to get them on early and then just watch them. Watch your herd. If you start seeing some cows blow up, you know, get them off. Um, if your cows are used to grazing alfalfa, they tend to do much better. When you come in with different, with naive cows, they don't do very well. And so just acclimate to them if you have to. And on a dry year, your risk of bloat will be the lowest you'll probably see. And I would stay on it. I think that's your best, best management is to stay on it the whole time. That's what Maddox, I know Maddox really does his, he goes on it and he stays on it. Yeah. You gotta, make sure your cows can handle that. Can they, is there, the milk production, the milk production is going to be crazy. So. Yeah, the system we had it on, like, you know, the grass was good the first time through and then we went into dry, dry, dry. This was in 2017. And so that second time through on that system and we were, on a running like 50 pair there on a it was a quarter section and I think we had that set up so there was like 16 pastures well the second time through that's really about the only thing I mean they were picking up some dry grass but it was pretty much alfalfa that they were grazing the second time through because it was the only thing that was tapping any moisture yet so and and we had we had good luck with it yeah I would suspect that at that phase as dry as you were bloat would not have had an issue yeah. And, and your red alfalfa can get down to water that grasses can't. And because of how alfalfa grows, it, every terminal bud is a growth point. You know, where grasses, the growth point's down at the bottom or somewhere up in, in one point. Alfalfa's got many, many growth points. So as they consume it, you create another regrowth by doing that. So you can enhance your production by doing that. And it's safe in those scenarios. Whatever works, right? In terms of right. dog, whatever you can do. Any other questions? I, I do have one question. Um, Kevin, because you said that there wasn't much for tillers and the grasses produced last fall. Uh, do, is, do you think there was much um, setback on grazing this winter versus, you know, usually when, a, when, the, um, when there's tillers and you graze into the winter, it causes it causes a slowdown in production in the spring. Right. But with the lack of tillers produced last fall, is does that did that grazing this winter make any difference on the production this spring? I would say no. I would say any tillers you had, whether you consumed them or not, probably most of them died. Unless you're in a really moist area, 
like an overflow site. Most of them died anyway, so I wouldn't, the grazing wouldn't, have, if you're gonna overgraze a winter pasture, lap this winter wouldn't hurt you at all <laughs> because the tillers all died. Thank so you. so you can expect though, and, and you've seen this, Chad, when you graze a winter pasture hard, you get a you get the slower grow. That's what all your pastures are going to do this year, because all the tillers die due to the drought. That's what that's what I kind of assume that I've been grazing more than I usually do, or a little a little more because I was I was kind of figuring that same thing is that uh, as long as there's still cover on the ground, it's not really affecting. The plant itself right and, and normally winter grazing as long as you don't remove that bottom tiller is safe i don't, I don't mind winter grazing at all it's just not, not grazing it too short well that, that was that was kind of a hard thing to do this winter yeah because it was all open yep Any other questions? Well, we had a, up to like 24 people join us on Facebook. So there's right. about 40 people on this evening. So um, nice turnout. Cool. Uh, any other questions? I'll throw it out there one more time. You're sure welcome to unmute yourself. And we've had a few come in on Facebook. So. Anything well, else, the, Kevin? Thanks for the invite. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank Kevin for joining us this evening. And um, next Thursday, we'll be on for our last one, um, probably until either next fall, winter, something. Um, we'll be on with uh, Josh and Tara Ducart talking about some holistic management again. And some of the stressors, of course, drought is obviously one of those that are uh, on people's uh, list right now. And uh, the recording will be on the Facebook page. And then I will try to get it posted to our YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, and then uh, we'll also have it on the website for the Grazing Lands Coalition. So uh, once again, Kevin, thank you for joining us. And thank you for the, the good information. And, and hopefully it's going to start raining on Sunday and we, uh, we won't have to worry about it near as much. Yes. Okay. All right. Everybody have a good evening and thank you for joining us.